Hi, and for those of you who just joined us, um, we do ask that you um, mute your, um, please mute yourselves, or I will mute all, I I'll do that once we get started. And we're probably gonna start in about a minute. So I'm gonna let a few more people join in. <clears throat> okay here we are um first of all welcome thank you so much for joining us in this online program i'm cheryl miller the director of the library and archives at the autry and I want to let everyone know, first of all, that we are recording this presentation. Um, so if that's a concern, we wanted to put that out up front. The Autry Museum of the American West acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern California Channel Islands. We recognize that the Autry Museum and its campuses are located on the traditional lands of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples and pay our respects to their ancestors, elders, and relatives past, present, and emerging. Before we start tonight, I want to call attention to a film that's going to be at the Autry Museum this Saturday, March 16th at 1.30. It's called Pure Grit. It is both a thrilling tale of extreme bareback horse racing and an intimate love story chronicling three years in the life of a young Native American bareback horse ra racer, her unwavering determination, and the relationships that sustain her. I'm going to go ahead and paste in the link in the chat. I can't get the chat to come up. Hang on. Uh, there it is. Okay. Um, and again, I urge you to, uh, uh, to uh, check that out. And uh, let me get it here. Oh, and one more thing. Um, it has a 100% positive rating on Rotten Tomatoes. So I think we all know how rare that can be. I'm going to paste this in right now. And there we go. Um, also, please put any questions you have in the chat. And we'll try to address them at the end of the presentations. I'm now going to turn it over to the archivist librarian, Alejandra Gaeta. Thank you, Cheryl, for that welcome, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight as we share our experience working on this project for the last two years. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, my name is Alejandra Gaeta. I am the archivist slash librarian here at the Autry and have, a, have had the great opportunity to work with this, the various gay rodeo collections we'll be discussing tonight. Um, I'm going to shut off my camera while I continue to, to speak, but I'll come back at the end um, to answer any questions. So I would like to first um, mention our funder for this project, the California State Library. Um, this presentation is part of the California Gay Rodeo History Project here at the Autry Museum. Funding for this two-year project was provided by the state of California, administered by the California State Library as part of their preservation and accessibility of California's LGBTQ plus history grant. So thank you to them. To give some guidance about what we're gonna be discussing tonight, here is a short agenda. I'll begin with a quick summary of what the grant project is, and I would like to then highlight some folks that were involved with this project in different capacities, um, then cover how we did the work and what sort of things came up as we did this work. Then I'll hand it over to Ezra Loeb, our metadata assistant for this project, to share some highlights from the various collections they worked on, and we'll wrap up with an answer to the question of what happens now that the grant period is ending. Afterwards, we'll have time for questions, so please feel free to type those into the chat, as Cheryl uh, mentioned at the beginning. Um, as we go into our presentation, we'll also um, give you an opportunity to unmute yourselves if you'd like to ask your questions out loud at the end, um, rather than typing them all out. So this um, description of the California Gay Rodeo History Project is almost completely straight from the project proposal, um, which I think gives a great general summary. Um, it's 
this was a two-year project from 20, starting in 2022 to preserve, provide access to, and encourage use of the Autry's California Gay Rodeo collections and collections that were donated to the Autry in 2022. These were collections that were promised as part of this grant. Um, the project highlights California-related material found in the following Autry collections. Um, the International Gay Rodeo Association Institutional Archives, I'll refer to them as IGRA from now on. The Personal Papers of Los Angeles Resident, Historian, and IGRA member Jim Wilkie. Photos from the Blake Little Photographs from the Gay Rodeo Exhibit, which toured to various venues in 2016 and up till 2019. And in addition, the project highlights the following two archive collections that were promised in the proposal and we did receive in 2022, the Golden State Gay Rodeo Association, um, or GSGRA as I'll refer to them uh, from now on, archives and the Gay Rodeo Oral History Project archives. In order um, to begin, I wanted to name some names to recognize some of the people involved with these projects. So on the left, you'll see mostly Autry folks starting with Lisa Posas, who is a grant proposal writer and project direct director up until she left um, the Autry, unfortunately, late last year. Um, she also moderated the panel for our last program in November of 2023. So if you were able to join us on November 2nd, you got a chance um, to hear from her. Cheryl, as she mentioned, is our director, but she has also cataloged the IGRA newsletters and programs and linked their PDFs to the catalog records to make these materials accessible through our library catalog. Catlin, Jenny, and Rick um, have all assisted with the physical processing and inventory of the IGRA collection as well. Laura um, is our grants person and has been great at making sure that we are all on the same page and meeting the deadlines. Um, as well as doing what we said we do for this project. So very thankful for her. Ben, um, with his experience and knowledge of programming has helped make sure our public programs are well executed and planned out. Josh, um, who's also unfortunately left the Autry, um, but was great in including gay rodeo materials in his exhibition, Imagine West. Um, he also led tours for both his exhibition, Imagine West and of the Resources Center to share some of the materials from the various gay rodeo collections um, in the last year. Lizbeth has been hard at work loading and linking the digitized images to our database um, to again, make those uh, publicly accessible as soon as possible. Roger uh, Bergman, a name I'm sure most folks are familiar with, has offered great advice, answered questions and shared so much institutional knowledge. His dedication and regular deposits to the IGRA archives are amazing. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Schofield has been a great project partner, prepping and taking great care to send the digital files from the oral history project safely and in a timely manner, despite having so much going on. Also completing additional oral histories for this project as well has been amazing. Hunter was our intern for the 2022 to 2023 academic year, and they were just wonderful, assisting with rehousing and inventorying hundreds of newsletters and programs. You'll hear their name again um, later on in this presentation. Andrea was only with us for a brief period, but really got the metadata work off of the ground with the Wilkie California items, IGRA posters, and laying the framework for the Gay Rodeo Oral History Project Archive. And Ezra took over and has been a great asset to the team, diving deep into the collections and making so many amazing connections and discovering such great stories. They are very carefully documenting their work and you will hear from them later on to hear more about what they've found. So where did we begin with this project? Um, as the largest collection, the IGRA Institutional Archives seemed the first we should tackle. As for this particular grant, we would need to highlight the California material. And if you aren't aware, the IGRA is an organization that traces its beginnings to the early 80s and still has chapters spread throughout the US and one in Canada as well. What we ended up doing was pulling the majority of the collection out to our reading room so I could physically review the material. In this photo of the boxes on shelves, the IGRA collection spans 16 of them. Uh, but what's not in this photo are the posters, which are stored separately in oversized storage. What I found with the majority of the material was, as expected, IGRA admin papers, correspondence, meeting notes, memos to IGRA members, and more. Although there were some California specific items, it was spread throughout. And I wanted to quickly note here that the IGRA headquarters are in Denver, Colorado. Unfortunately, we did not have the time to process the entirety of this collection at the folder level. But what I did find was that the chapter specific material 
those items produced by the chapter associations based in California, such as the newsletters and rodeo programs could be pulled from where they had been kept uh, within all of these boxes, um, chrono chronologically, but interspersed with the rest of the material. Those could be pulled and we could then catalog them individually to bring out the history of the California-based chapter associations and the Golden State Gay Rodeo Association as the member association to IGRA. In early 2022 is where we began pulling these types of materials from the over 90 document boxes and temporarily storing them in new ones. Hunter, our accidental intern who I mentioned earlier, joined us as we were wrapped on the pulling and they began to organize and inventory these newsletters and programs so we would know what California specific material we had. Um, the programs were organized chronologically by year and the newsletters were first organized alphabetically by the chapter association and then chronologically. This arrangement also allows us to add to the collection because this is what is typically called an open collection, meaning it will continue to be added to. As Roger Bergman, who I mentioned earlier, has so generously continued to do so for the last couple of years. And the image here, you can see some of the finished product with these nicely uh, foldered and barcoded grams. So what this uh, work would give us the ability to do is to create individual records and assign ID numbers to this material within our database, uh, which in order to digitize it, it needs to have a record in our database with a unique ID number. Um, ideally, this number is permanent so that the file name of the digital images would match the record in our database. I don't usually get into the weeds this much, but I wanted to make sure that um, this is shared because it is a major thing to consider when processing archival collections. Usually individual items are not given unique and permanent numbers, but um, in this case, we had to, to make sure that we could digitize the collection. Um, in this process, oh, I actually moved ahead too quickly. In this process, I wanted to mention Hunter, who was working so diligently on organizing and inventorying the newsletters and programs, found some great stories. As they worked on this, these collections, they read through the material and were always very happy to share their findings and in particular loved reading through the newsletters as some, in, some really documented the sense of community in these chapter associations with dedicated gossip columns and photos from chapter events and gatherings. While we had started working on the physical processing of the IGRA collection, Autry staff reviewed the Jim Wilkie gay rodeo items and the Blake Little photographs to identify the specific California re related material. When our first metadata assistant was hired in 2023, they were able to work on creating better descriptions for this material in our database and began to develop additional subject terms to link to these particular records. When I refer to these subject terms, um, think of the clickable terms towards the bottom of a library catalog record. They are the keywords that folks can search to find this and other related material. Um, you can also click on them and see what material has been assigned the same term. So in this example of a collections online record, collections online is the Autry's uh, publicly accessible digital uh, database. This example of the Blake of a Blake Little photograph, you can see the subject terms at the bottom, which you can click and it will show you other items across the different collections in the Autry collections that pertain to gay rodeo. For example, if you click on the gay rodeo term, you can also see that Blake Little's name is hyperlinked as well in the maker field, uh, meaning you can click on his name and see related material as well as his people record, which I will describe um, later on. As we started delving deeper into this work, some interesting things started coming up. As I mentioned at first, it was this need to identify the California items in the large IGRA collection, and then figuring out the best way to handle numbering for digitization purposes, um, but also a numbering system that would work as the collection was added on to in the future. Then we received the two promised collections, the Gay Rodeo Oral History Project Archives and the Golden State Gay Rodeo Association Archives. Um, I just really wanted to share, share this image um, with the California being made out of all these faces. I think it's one of our, our favorite ones we found so far. Uh, on this slide, you can see a screenshot of the Voices of Gay Rodeo website through which Rebecca Schofield and her team, who are the um, creators of this particular archive, um, they've been making the content for the oral histories accessible through here. With the Gay Rodeo Oral History Project, we were receiving a mostly born digital collection of the audio files, transcript files, and also some images. 
Born digital is a term used in archives and libraries for these materials that or originate in a computer environment. Um, and processing a born digital collection is complicated as you need to consider digital space to store it, also to work on it. So doing things like opening the files, renaming them, and potentially also converting files to more stable file types. For this particular collection, one example was changing Word documents into PDFs, which is a more stable file type in the long term. We also received the GSGRA collection, which is smaller than the IGRA collection, and with, but with an inventory, we could identify that it did overlap a tiny bit with the IGRA collection, but not, my, but not by much. Um, in fact, it included a collection of newsletters titled The Shoot, which you can see the logo here on this slide, that filled some of the missing issues that were in the IGRA collection. So mostly what this collection needed was some rehousing, um, into acid-free folders, some boxes, and a descriptive finding name. This is another way that we're making this collection, these collections more accessible, um, is to create really uh, descriptive finding aids. So if you're not familiar, a finding aid is a guide to an archival collection. It provides context for the creator and or subjects of the collection and describes the amount and type of material that can be found in the collection. Here's an example of the IGRA Institutional Archives Finding Aid. It can be found on the Online Archive of California website, which we can share the link later on um, in the chat, or you can also find it by searching our Autry Library catalog. It's linked to the record for this particular collection. So in addition to, to the finding aid, part of making collections findable and usable is labeling the items with subject terms. Um, as I mentioned before, these key terms are also known as subject headings. When you search a database, the search engine will use your search terms and retrieve objects with subject headings that match. In order to make the IGRA collections accessible on our database, we needed to add terms that appropriately describe the collection and align with the words that you, the researcher, would use to look up the collection online. Because LGBTQ plus people are an underrepresented and marginalized group in archives, we needed to add terminology related to them to the Autry's database. We added 63, 63 subject headings, including terms like transgender people and gay bars, in order to provide more discoverability of the gay rodeo collections. This is really important because inclusion of these terms in the database at the Autry demonstrates that they belong here and that they are part of the story of the American West. When people ask why the gay rodeo collections are at the Autry, we can show IGRA side by side with all of the other rodeo collections and the diverse stories of Western peoples all on their own terms. We also had a great discussion about identifying terms as part of the work of adding subject terms to our database. Um, the various terms listed on this slide, cowboy, cowgirl, cowperson, cow folks with the various spellings have been used throughout the collections, but also outside of them in publications such as Slapping Leather, Queer Cow Folks at the Gay Rodeo by Alyssa Ford and Rebecca Schofield. Um, this publication was just, just came out this year. This is a general issue of just trying to standardize and categorize item, items of trying to fit lots of identities within umbrella terms to be able to discuss them. Ultimately, we decided to add cow folks as a more gender inclusive form, but also continuing to use cowboy and cowgirl. If you are a member of Gay Rodeo and would like to give us your thoughts, please do so in the chat. Um, is there one of these terms or a different one you identify with? The people records I mentioned on this slide are what they sound like, records for folks featured in the newsletters and programs that provided some background information and also highlighted their involvement with various aspects of Gay Rodeo. And then related to this topic of people, privacy concerns um, especially came up with the newsletters. Um, it was a very intense topic of discussion within our team because the newsletters contained personal contact information, including phone numbers, addresses, and eventually email addresses. We made the decision to retract some of this information in the digitized copies of the GSGRA newsletters. We don't plan to retract the original newsletters and we have allowed and will continue to allow access to the physical newsletters, but we, do, we decided we do not want to post this type of information on the internet as a general practice. The issue of privacy also came up with the Gay Rodeo Oral History Project as interviewees were asked to provide a preferred name to be identified as, but some of the material um, in the actual collection contained their name as well as some personal contact information. This made sense as it was required as part of the process of gathering the oral histories and ensuring releases were signed. 
So Rebecca and her team also transcribed these interviews, shared the transcripts with the interviewees to give them an opportunity to edit them, to create a final product that would then be shared on the Voices of Gay Rodeo web exhibition, like the screenshot that you saw earlier. In order to ensure we may maintain this level of privacy, we have ensured that the finding aid for this collection, as well as the records in the collection's online website and the Autry Library catalog only use a specified name for the interviewee. Um, while we started, had started working on this project, we had also um, had some class visits and tours in which we were happy to pull out some of the gay rodeo material um, to show. So in this first image, you see a high school class from Santa Monica. They are part of the youth docent program that the Autry Education Department heads in collaboration with their um, high school. They visited the archive after their visit to the museum to see the differences between the museum and the archive. Um, and you see the students here handling mostly the clothing, some clothing from the IGRA collection. One of them is holding a belt buckle uh, which is the only belt buckle we have in the archive collection. Um, and we had not at this point yet started to fully pull the newsletters and programs. We had just started getting into um, this larger collection. So you can see just a few items, but if you look at the following year, we had another youth docent class visit um, and with Hunter's um, influence and great notes, we were able to identify a larger variety of material to share with this particular class, and they loved it. They crowded around the programs in particular, were reading portions of it out loud to each other. It was so interesting to hear them um, talk about it and, and it, it just talk about what they thought of these items that were mostly from the 90s, um, and uh, particularly topics or, or things that they were interesting, they were interested in or surprised to see. Um, at this time period. The next class visit um, was from an undergraduate class from Occidental College. Um, this class was focused on queer archives in LA and actually Hunter was our connection that led to this visit. Um, a friend of theirs was in this class and once Hunter mentioned their project to them, this friend would let the professor know. And this professor was very excited to hear about the collections, a bit surprised to hear about them being at the Autry. They usually took this class on a trip to see the one lesbian and gay archives, but they were closed at the time due to renovations. So they were very excited to schedule this visit to the to the Autry uh, Resources Center. Again, the students gathered around the programs and newsletters. We had also pulled out some magazines that were in the collection, um, not all of them being specifically focused on gay rodeo, but very pertinent to the community. So they were very excited to see that. This other tour you can see here um, was led by Josh and Lisa, the two former Autry folks. Um, they uh, gave this tour for IGRA folks in June. And although it was a small group, it was a great tour of the Resources Center. And you can see um, Roger and Amy, two longtime IGRA members, looking at the Blake Little photographs in person. Um, thanks to Roger, we were also notified that the Blake Little photograph that they're looking at on the image on your right is uh, an inspiration for a later LA rodeo program, which you can see on this slide. So this is just a great example of how getting this opportunity to delve deeper into the archives led us to make these connections between the materials themselves as well. Um, this Next slide is a photo of the panel we held after the dramatic reading of That Damn Horse. So um, this day, on November 2nd of last year, we held public programming as part of this grant project. Um, that included a DIY archive workshop in which we shared some tips and guidelines for folks to take care of their archives at home. And later that evening was this dramatic reading of uh, it, a collection of quotes from uh, Voices of Gay Rodeo written by Rebecca Schofield and a uh, partner. So this particular panel was after the reading. It featured Rebecca Schofield, um, who you see on Roger's uh, left, and Roger and then Court Fund, who was one of the student assistants who also contributed to the interviews. And this was moderated by Lisa Posas. Um, I wish I had taken a photo of the stage when the actors uh, were set up. Unfortunately, I missed that moment. It was a wonderful, very emotional performance. So if you manage to make it, um, and if you hear about it again, please make sure to attend. Um, I also was not able to take a photo, but Roger had taken the time to set up a great display of the IGRA archives in the lobby. 
Um, but he does this at various IGRA sanctioned rodeos throughout the year. So if you do make it to one, make sure to check out his booth. So these next few slides are just to demonstrate some of the gay rodeo material, both from the archives and from the museum's permanent collections that are included in the Imagine West exhibition. Here you can see what we have um, called the library case because these, these are all materials from the archives, includes some of Jim Wilkie's personal papers and um, a program or two from the IGRA archives. And then hanging on the wall in the back, you can see a framed photo of, from Blake Little's collection. Um, on this side, you can see on the left-hand side is a photo of Scott Terry's rodeo outfit that is on one side of the, the exhibit. And then on the other side, on the right-hand side, you see one of the IGRA um, rodeo posters right in the center, right below the, the big Flaming Crisis um, poster. And then this last photo, which is not a very great photo, but I wanted to share it, is a photo of the media piece that was just recently installed as part of this grant project, which features quotes from the Gay Rodeo Oral History Project archives. Um, Ezra did some great work to prep some of the options for Josh, um, the curator for this, for this collection, or sorry, for this um, exhibit to choose from. So now I'll hand it over to them to continue with some highlights that they would like to share from the collections. Take it away. Sure thing. Um, hi, everyone. I wanted to thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Ezra, and like Ale said, I was one of the metadata assistants for this project. I'm really excited to share with all of you some of the highlights from the Autry's Gay Rodeo Collections and to offer some context around all the work that IGRA, the Autry, and others have done to preserve the history of gay rodeo. So we're going to start out here with some of the posters advertising rodeos produced by IGRA member associations. We processed over a hundred of these posters and most of them have incredible original art, including a mix of country Western and LGBTQ plus iconography. We have a couple of my favorites here. And so on the left, we have a poster advertising the 1995 Palm Springs Regional Rodeo, which depicts a saddled saguaro cactus backed by an upside down pink triangle. The saddle and the saguaro cactus are staple icons of the American West and the pink triangle is a reclaimed symbol declaring gay pride. On the other side, from Chicago's Windy City Gay Rodeo, we see a different sort of mixing. A purple cowboy satyr rides a centaur wearing a rodeo buckle, while a rodeo clown and bull riding cowgirl cross the background. It's a marvelously campy depiction of rodeo, and I personally would love to learn more about how this design came about. But regardless of the specific origins, each of these posters say a lot about how the rodeo associations wanted to represent themselves and their connection between country Western and LGBTQ plus communities. You can go to the next slide. In addition to the posters, the Gay Rodeo Collections included hundreds of programs. And I wanted to highlight especially the ways that the programs document local LGBTQ plus histories and subcultures, especially through biographies of Grand Marshals and advertisements. The Grand Marshals are the people who lead the parades that open the Gay Rodeo. They tended to be an activist, artist, community organizer, politician, or business owner honored for their contributions to the local LGBTQ plus community. Pictured up at the top is Cleve Jones, who was the Grand Marshal for the Bay Area Regional Rodeo in 1995. Cleve Jones is an activist who conceptualized the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt and who created the first panel. The quilt now has hundreds of thousands of panels, all dedicated with love to the memory of people who have died from AIDS-related illness since the start of the epidemic. The Grand Marshals in the rodeo programs show the evolving interests of local LGBTQ plus communities, document what was happening locally, and connect that local organizing to broader social movements. We can learn even more about local communities by tracing the advertisements in the programs. On the left, we have an ad for a new Levi Leather Bar in San Francisco's preeminent gayborhood, the Castro. And on the right, we have an ad for a concert by the San Francisco Gay Man Men's Chorus. Through these advertisements, we can see where subcommunities of people were gathering around different interests and purposes, and we can see where these different communities overlapped in their activities to form a shared identity, identity as gay people. With programs crossing dozens of cities and towns across the United States and Canada over decades, there is so much to learn about all of these different communities and how they changed over time with these collections. We can move on to the next slide. So while uh, the programs show inter-community relationships, the newsletters in the Golden State Gay Rodeo Association collection document the inner workings of the gay rodeo community and 
like uh, Ale mentioned earlier and uh, Hunter had expressed before, um, they are hilarious. Um, interspersed among news updates and calls for volunteers were gossip columns and reprinted jokes and humorous photographs. And I particularly love the photograph on the left, which shows the arena director of the Los Angeles Rodeo talking with two trustees of the Golden State Gay Rodeo Association who are dressed in cow costumes, including little floppy ears. Um, at the top, we have a dictionary de definition of the word genuflect, which in addition to the definition that we know, uh, quote, to bend the knee as in worship, end quote, apparently also means the appropriate action when greeting the new president of the International Gay Rodeo Association. And like we like to say, we learn something new every day here in the archives. But in addition to all of the humor throughout the newsletters, there are also loving tributes to members who passed away as a result of the AIDS epidemic or in other circumstances. So here at the bottom of the slide here, we have a tribute to a member of the Capital Crossroads chapter of the gay of, of GSGRA, um, who unfortunately died during one of the rodeos in 1999. All of these tributes point to the love community members had for each other in difficult times. And as we process, um, and use these collections, we too can lovingly hold their memories into the future. But the memorials themselves aren't without their humor too. On the right, we have, quote, the final appearance of a grand old lady, um, which refers not to the rodeo royal depicted in the photograph, as we might guess, but to the Jeep that they're standing on. These newsletters truly find some kind of balance holding the griefs and joys of the community. And we can go to the next slide. So, um, this is the giant wall of text part of the presentation. Um, and I wanna say thank you to the IJR members who are identifying the people in the photographs. Um, and thank you all for bearing with the giant wall of text on this screen now. Um, I wanted to um, highlight some aspects of the Gay Rodeo Oral History Project archives, um, which uh, were a collection of about 60 oral history interviews conducted by Rebecca Schofield, who is at the University of Idaho um, these interviews uh, document a multiplicity of experiences at the Gay Rodeo, and honestly, they are beautiful. They uh, trace the connections that Gay Rodeo had to other areas of participants' lives, and they reflect the deep emotional resonance of Gay Rodeo for many of those who were involved. They breathe more life into our paper materials that we have in the other collections, and they offer perspectives on Gay Rodeo from those who don't appear as frequently in the other collections, especially women and people of color. I wanted to highlight this excerpt here because of its detailed description of the connections gay rodeoers had to charitable giving and particularly the role of rodeo royalty in facilitating that community support. Every gay rodeo association produces a royalty pageant in which contestants are tested not just on their country Western attire, but their knowledge of gay rodeo rules and history. Winners in each category served as representatives of Gay Rodeo to other organizations and coordinated fundraisers for the Gay Rodeo and for other community service groups. Chili Pepper, uh, who was one of the interviewees and whose quote is on the slide here, um, was a former uh, Miss IGRA, um, a drag queen performer turned rodeo royal. In her interview, she describes the relationship between her rodeo organization, the Texas Gay Rodeo Association, and groups that serve people living with HIV and AIDS. As a rodeo royal or a sash queen, as they sometimes called it, she uh, performed in drag shows to pre uh, prepare apartments for people who were released from the hospital. This kind of direct service work was, an additional, was additional to the monies uh, that were raised by the rodeos, which were themselves fundraisers. And throughout the interviews, people tell stories about the ways that they supported and were supported by others during a period of crisis for LGBTQ plus communities. We can move on to the next one. And I wanted to highlight this next excerpt because of how it draws attention to the ways that gay rodeo is distinct and how women are able to participate. In most other rodeo contexts, women are only permitted to compete in a few events, which involve roping skills or speed events on, horse, on horseback. As Desiree Benavidez describes here, the gay rodeo subverted gender roles at the rodeo. All women, both cisgender and transgender, are permitted to compete in all events, including rough stock events like bull riding. This meant that a significant number of straight women were also regular participants in the gay rodeo because there was an inclusive outlet for the sport that they loved. Desiree herself is a trans woman who participated in the, rodeo, uh, the royalty pageants and in the gay rodeo. Elsewhere in her interview, she describes how she was able to participate in women's events without experiencing the transphobic backlash that she had experienced in other contexts. 
Desiree's interview provides insight not just into the efforts towards trans inclusion at IGRA, but the evolving conditions of trans people in all the places that she moved through. And to me, this underscores the incredible value of these collections overall, that they highlight both the production and experiences of gay rodeo and the interconnections between gay rodeo and the many communities that they were embedded in, both rural and urban, LGBTQ+, and otherwise. I really hope that you all enjoyed these collection highlights as much as I did, and I'll be really happy to answer any questions about them at the end of our program. And back to Ale. Thank you, Ezra. So what happens next? Um, as this project at period ends this month, we are wrapping up our work and working on getting most of that stuff published online through the Autry Library catalog, the collections online website, and through the Finding Aids published on the Online Archive of California. Uh, we want to continue sharing what we have been, what has been accomplished with this grant project, especially by highlighting gay rodeo materials with tours and student groups. And the work continues on these collections, as does the work to preserve and promote the history of gay rodeo. I wanted to thank everyone. I wanted to thank, thank everyone again and then open it up to questions. Uh, we'll take a look at what's in the chat and then we will um, also take questions if you want to raise your hand so you can we can call on you and then you can unmute yourself feel free it looks like brian has raised his hand so we're going to go to him first thank you cheryl first of all uh, <clears throat> uh, what a great presentation uh it just made me be uh pr very proud to be part of igra and, and the autry family so very, very wonderful uh, my question is this um is there a way to share this with the members of IGRA, would they go to the Autry site to see this? Um, how can we do that? And is it permissible for me to share some pictures from your presentation on the IGRA member forum, uh, sort of highlighting the presentation tonight? Of course. Um, we are also recording this presentation, so hopefully we'll be able to share it um, with folks soon. I know we have, as you have RSVP'd, we have your email. Uh, so we'll probably send out an email to uh, let you know when this has been posted and where it has been posted. Um, and if folks are interested in coming in to see the collections, they're more than welcome to. If you go to the Autry.org um, in the research and collections section, um, you can fill out a form to come in and do research. Um, there's also a general questions form. Um, and yeah, feel free to share uh, amongst members. We're always grateful to get information and like get connected with members to hear their stories. And as um, some folks were doing in the chat, um, identifying some folks in the photos, that's always great. Yes, well, thank you, Alexandra. Um, if I think uh, both Amy and Roger and myself may have other uh, you know names for you that maybe you don't have that you want to have in the background or you know or whatever. Um, but uh, if you can, please send myself and probably Roger. I'm sure he wants it too, and also Amy. Um, you know a link to this um, presentation. It really was quite something, and I you know we, I just want to share it with our folks. So something to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Really glad to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's definitely our, our uh, that's that's why we're recording it. <laughs> we know that not everyone can come out at a 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, excuse me, 7 p.m. California time mm -hmm. on a Wednesday night. So um, there's why that's, we'll have the recording as a, as a way to extend the reach. Yes, Roger, I see your, your hand mm -hmm. moving. <laughs> I just want to compliment you on this uh, uh, video uh, tonight. It was uh, a very good presentation. Um, I got a question during it. They said, do they really only have one belt buckle? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you only have one belt buckle, but we are looking at, uh, at getting our collection uh, uh, that we have. We have probably about 500 belt buckles now, and maybe when we have some buckles that are similar from the same rodeo, we may be able to start sharing those. That's all. I want to clarify, we only have one belt buckle in our archival collection. Um, and to be truthful, I'm not entirely sure if there isn't a belt buckle in the permanent collections, which is the museum collections. Okay, well, I know that you have one from Scott Terry. Yeah. Go ahead, Amy. Can you hear me, Alejandra? 
Okay. Um, also, this isn't a question. Um, I I met you, I think it was in September. I don't know. It was a long time ago. And um, for the people that haven't, that are on this Zoom, that haven't had the luxury of the behind the scenes tour, um, the, the care and the dedication and the love that you and your fellow team members are are treating our material with is absolutely overwhelming and um i just wanted to say thanks that's all not a question just thanks no, it was great meeting you too, Amy. And thank you so much for your kind words. We're grateful and very excited to be able to um, speak to and share with, uh, you know, gay rodeo folks in general. Like it, it is great to see um, and hear stories firsthand. Um, so it was really amazing. I feel like we are grateful to have Roger visit us uh, from time to time. And it was great to meet you as well. So I'm looking forward to hopefully more opportunities to to have the rodeo folks involved. Roger, Roger is a rock star. And I see someone uh, knows Chili, so that's great. <laughs> I don't know your name because there it's I L G R A, but thanks. <laughs> um, go ahead, Victoria. Hi. Um, first off, fantastic work. This whole whole project is really incredible. Um, I was just kind of curious, and it's maybe a bit of a broad question. Um, since you're covering such a uh, vast range of history, did you run into any complications or situations where you had to adjust metadata standards or approach things in descriptions to accommodate past social approaches to different verbiage or topics? That is a good question. We haven't, I think, come across anything too drastic, but we as an organization, I think, deal with a lot of issues, as most archives and libraries most likely do, with problematic words used in um, folder titles or even published materials. And I think our method of handling it is just um, trying to be explicit in that in our in whatever way we can so in our finding aids we have a note to say you know keep in mind that these are um items from the past it could be the recent past and there are terms that folks don't use anymore for various reasons are offensive problematic um but also i feel like there's um with communities like the lgbtq plus community there there are terms that are reclaimed and some folks may find offensive may have found, found it offensive before and may there are terms that may have been found, may be found offensive now. And so I think it's just a matter of uh, being aware of that. So I feel like what we try to do is provide context for the collections to be able to explain that. Um, but so far, I can't think of a good example specifically. I don't know, Ezra, if you wanna add to that. Um, one of the things that was really remarkable to me was that um, the language issue, particularly while going through the GSGRA newsletters and programs, didn't really come up too much. And that was something that surprised me. A lot of the language is pretty consistent. Um, but I would just uh, echo what Ale said, that what if anything does come up or if anything had come up, um, we would usually, we would be um, trying to provide context around the usage of certain terms or what may be um, used now. And all of the um, subject terms and uh, subject headings that we used for the finding aid or for the item level descriptions um, are all rooted in uh, contemporary um, standards and where they differ, we would mark them. Sounds great. Thank you so much for sharing. Any other questions? Do you want to read the message in the chat? It's a great message. Can you read? Can you see it? Uh, I see Chili or Tony is the current president of the Illinois Gay Rodeo Association, and uh, you're the VP, so that's great. Um, and I also see Brian uh, posted that in 2025, IGRA will have the first rodeo of the 50th year of gay rodeo in the U.S. and Canada, and we are planning a big celebration in Reno, where in 1988 we were turned away at gunpoint. 
Um, so please join us in October 2025. Thank you, Brian, for sharing that. That's amazing. Uh, it looks like we have a question from another Brian, popular name here. Hey, Brian. Uh, tell us. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you to the Autry. As always, this is a top quality archival presentation and project, and you've just done excellent work across the board. I'm so excited. Um, I'm curious to know, I saw earlier in the slide that there were additional archives donated by about 200 other organizations or individuals. And my participation in the Gay Rodeo Association was through the entertainment and dance community. Mm -hmm. uh, dance festival is always a big part of IGRA and GSGRA rodeos. And so I was just wondering if you would talk uh, just briefly about maybe what's been, what uh, you've come across or what's been assembled or collected from the, the dance community during those times, especially during the 90s. I think Ezra can take that. Yes, um, my one regret about the limit time limitations about the collection highlights was that I couldn't talk about the country western dance aspect of IGRA. <laughs> um, it's really, um, I, I can't speak to the admin files or where country western dancing shows up for that, um, but country western dance is kind of ubiquitous in the programs and the newsletters that we've come across. Yeah. Um, so among the subject terms that we added, country western dance was on, on them. Among the people and organization records that we added, um, we included um, specific country western dance associations. So the example I can think of the top of my head was the Sundance Saloon, which is a uh, California based and I think uh, in uh, the Bay Area. Um, and so they kind of appeared across the GSGRA programs and occasionally in the newsletters. And so that was the kind of uh, opportunity that was presented by the people records was that we could kind of surface those aspects of gay rodeo through um, the subject terminology through the people records so that people knew that country Western dancing was also a huge part of the gay rodeo, even though it was under this umbrella of gay rodeo. Um, and I do hope that answers your question. <laughs> this is Roger. Um, regarding the dance, uh, uh, specifically for California, if you go to the rodeo programs for LA, San Diego, Palm Springs, and San Francisco, uh, usually within those programs, they list the entertainers in many cases. And that, that includes the dance groups that would travel to the different programs. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Oh, I see there's a message, hang on. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, Pre-HIV, oh, I lost it, go back. <laughs> there would have been 3,000 plus dancers at the LA, San Diego, and DC rodeos. That's incredible. Wow, I agree with you, Ezra. Wow is right. And 2025, get, 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 your, get your moves ready. <laughs> Apparently they're planning for a big dance for the 2025. Are there any additional questions or uh, follow-up comments? Okay, Alejandra, I will let you have the last word if you want it. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you all for joining. Please um, let folks know about these collections. We are also doing our best to make sure folks are aware of these collections. And we're always looking forward to um, sharing what we have and also um, hearing your stories and getting your the information you have um, as longtime members. Uh, participants, attendees of the rodeo. So please feel free to reach out. Um, uh, I will post my email in the chat. So if you have any questions or follow up, please feel free to re uh, reach out. Also the Autry um, uh, website is a great resource. Um, and also if you're local to Los Angeles, please feel free to come in on Saturday to see the um, uh, film. film screening. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us. It was great um, speaking to you all and I hope we'll hear from you soon. And you, if you can come visit the Autry, please do. You can see the wonderful um, pieces in the Imagine West exhibit for sure.